Let's start. Okay. So hello, good morning, good afternoon. See, I always say good morning because I've been teaching only in the morning for like two years. And so now when I see people, I say good morning to them no matter what time of the day it is. So like I'll be leaving here in two more hours and I'll be saying, oh, good morning and like a crazy person. Anyway, um, let's jump back into where we were on Friday. Oh, yeah. Before we do that, I'd just like to give you lots and lots of heads up about quiz two. I'm thinking probably Friday, February 18th. So that's not this Friday. That's actually next Friday. So it's quite a ways. It's quite a ways away. But I just thought I would tell you as soon as I thought I knew, just so you're not surprised. So I think that'll be quiz two. And it'll be on all of this human evolution, beginnings of culture things. Um, I'll post this in Moodle for sure, and that's probably when we'll do it, okay? I'll let you know if anything changes, but I just want to let you know as soon as I, as soon as I can, okay? Um, all right. So on Friday, I was walking you through, or trying to walk you through a little bit of the story of human evolution, right? And it was, it was a long story. It was a story that was millions and millions of years long. And I use this graphic just to sort of show you two important slices of time, right? One where we met our first primate common ancestor, right, in the Tharctus about 50 million years ago. And then we kind of jump forward to about 5 million years ago to look at how bipedal primates started to kind of evolve and diversify, right? And so in between that is you know, a 45 million year period where there's lots of different types of primates. Some of them are in the trees. Some of them are bigger. Some of them are smaller. Toward the end of that period, they're going to start splitting off into apes and monkeys and things like that. But this isn't a class in primate evolution. This is a class in, well, it's not even a class in human evolution. <laughs> it's a class in anthropology. So we can't really deal with all of that stuff, right? So. We jumped to about five million years ago, and I started to try to tell you the story of that evolution. But I said, this story is a complex one, and it's one that not really everyone agrees on. And there's a number of reasons for that. And I said that this is a long, long, long period of time, right? Um, it's difficult to think about, but it's also difficult to accurately describe because it's just, it's so long, right? Even if you can kind of imagine this in your head, this five million year period, it's a lot to describe, right? It's a lot to figure out. And so we have a very long story to tell. Um, we said that the things that we're basing this story on are basically the physical remains of plants and animals from millions of years ago, right? Fossilized bone for the most part. Um, we said that those were quite fragmentary and broken and crushed. Some of them are missing. And so it's a very difficult um, job to try to piece these things together to see what kind of animal you're looking at, right? Um, of course, part of that difficulty is not just the condition of the remains, but we don't actually know what these creatures really were like in, in real life, right? No, none of us have ever seen one. And so we really don't know, you know, I made this analogy last class between, you know, <clears throat> building a puzzle, but you don't have the box top. So you don't really know what the puzzle is supposed to look like. And so it's a very difficult process of trying to figure these things out. Again, some of the people that we met in, um, <clears throat> excuse me, some of the people that we met in the Your Inner Fish documentary were, you know, the best of the best, Don Johansson and C. Owen Lovejoy and Tim White. They're big, big names in paleoanthropology. They really know what they're doing, but it's not an easy, it's not an easy process. It's not an easy science. We said that really we don't have a lot of remains from this time period, right? It's a long period and there's individuals from certain time slices, but we don't really have a complete picture. And so again, it's difficult it's difficult to build that puzzle when you don't really have all the pieces. And you don't even know how many pieces there are, right? So we don't know, not only do we, some of the things we know we're not sure of, but we actually, 
in some cases, we don't know what we don't know, right? There, there are species that may have existed that we ha haven't found. And so, yeah, we, we don't know what we don't know at the moment. Um, I said very quickly that some of the, the dating of some of these specimens is very difficult because they're stone, they're not bone anymore, and so you have to use different techniques, and some of those are difficult to um, get a clear picture on. We said the definition of a species was important because how we know whether we have two, uh, two species or one is whether they can mate and give us fertile offspring. But of course, with extinct animals, you can't do that, right? You just have to compare them and see, gee, are they, are they similar or are they different, right? Same species or different species. But then we said that some people, you know, are much more likely to lump things together and say, oh, same species, no problem. They're just different sizes or just slightly different looking. Some people are much more likely to split them and say, oh, no, these are two different species, right? So there's lumpers and then there's splitters, right? Who's right? Well, more, <laughs> more, more work will, will tell us, right? But it's a, it's a complicated picture. Right, so I showed us this, um, this graphic on Friday as well. And again, it's kind of color-coded. I like things that are color-coded. And it shows us some of the different genera, the different um, kind of families of bipedal primates that were around five million years ago to now. And so I walked you through some of them. <clears throat> we got to, I think, Homo, um, Homo erectus. As you can see here, if you can read some of the text, there's species here that we haven't really talked about. Um, there's a Homo rudolfensis up there. We're not going to talk about him. Homo ergaster is kind of what they call Homo erectus that stayed in, that stayed in Africa. Um, there's a few other species here. There's a Kenyanthropus there that we didn't talk about. And so, there are other species around. Um, a couple of other species have been found since a graphic like this was created. And so, again, I'm trying to give you a, a general picture of what happened. <clears throat> it's not accurate. Not everyone would agree with the story I'm telling you, OK? So if you hear other details in other classes, don't come back and say, hey, Mike, you taught me the wrong thing. I'm telling you right now, I'm teaching you the wrong thing. <laughs> but it's a it's an evolving it's an evolving science right we're always finding out new things so we started off around four or four and a half million years ago with artipithecus we met artipithecus in the your inner fish video maybe the first primate to walk on two feet if not probably very close to that time period and we said artipithecus was kind of uh, kind of the, the What's that? I'm just going to review very quickly. Is that okay? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So <clears throat> Artipithecus is kind of a strange creature. I think somebody said it's kind of the best of both worlds. And that's a, a good description of Artipithecus, right? It's got a lot of tree climbing adaptations, like long fingers and long arms. The bottom of the pelvis is quite long. But the top of the pelvis is quite short, which is a bipedal adaptation. This thing can walk on two feet. It's got fairly flat feet to, to walk on the, on the ground. But here you've got these big toes which diverge and can grab onto things, right? It's not super ideal for walking on two feet. You can do it, a little awkward. But in the trees, very helpful, right? So this creature is probably the first creature to walk on two feet. But again, when we watch the documentary with your inner fish, we're not really sure why this thing was walking on two feet in the first place, right? This creature was still living in the forest. There was an earlier theory that we were driven out into the savanna because of climate change and things dried and forest turned to grassland. But here we have a creature that's already walking on two feet in the forest. And so again, we're not quite sure why that is, but and the way evolution works is that if something's not beneficial, it tends to disappear, right? So there must have been some useful reason for this creature to walk on two feet. We're just not really sure what it is right now. 
we met uh, Australopithecus afarensis, right? We met Lucy. We kind of talked about how beautiful she was, or maybe that was just me. Um, I don't have a crush on Lucy, I promise you. Um, Lucy here shows up a little bit after Artipithecus, but she is, um, or they are, much more adapted to walking on two feet, right? So their pelvis looks a lot, more, lot, uh, a lot more like ours. The angle of their leg bones is a lot more like us. If you were to look at her feet, you would see that her feet look kind of like ours. No big grasping toe, but a toe that's a big toe that's in line with all the others. Right? So she's a creature that comes a little bit after Artipithecus and is much better at better adapted to walking on two feet. Okay? We met this guy here, Paranthropus boisei. There's a couple of Paranthropus species running around. They're kind of strange. They're kind of like an Australopithecus, but they're very beefy, right? Very well built. Big bones, big muscles, big heads. Kind of very interesting faces, but again, maybe that's just the artist. Um, whoops. And I pointed this out because I wanted to, I wanted to demonstrate that there's kind of. There's what? Yes. And they have the same brain 500 to 550. That's what I think. Yeah, give or take. And so these creatures have, you know, kind of reasonably, well, as compared to us, they have small brains. As compared to an ape, pretty normal, right? So even though these creatures were able to walk around on two feet somewhat like us, we shouldn't be expecting any serious intellect from them, right? They are very much still in the ape level of intelligence, okay? Um, yeah, and as you can see here, there's uh, Paranthropus is kind of a chunky, built, um, bipedal primate. Australopithecus, a much kind of lighter, lighter built version. Slimmer bones, slimmer body, two different kinds, okay? Um, yeah, and that brought us to the genus Homo, right? Our species, or our, sorry, our, our, le, le, le. Okay, taking a break. Our genus, right? Our genus is Homo. This is the first of our particular family, right? Homo habilis. Again, we see that there's an increase in brain size, right? Which is somewhat correlated with intelligence. It's kind of all we have at this point to, to kind of measure that. But we said that Homo habilis was notable for a few reasons. Number one, it's a slightly taller hominid than we've seen before, a little closer to our own height. We see a slightly larger brain, but even more important, we longer. see the very first what? Longer arms. Longer arms. Yeah, still, still a little bit long. Not, um, not quite so long as Lucy, maybe, a little bit shorter. Um, because this is, a, this is a creature that's fully adapted to life outside of the trees, right? So Artipithecus was spending probably a good portion of their time in the trees. Australopithecus, I could imagine climbing trees for safety, right? Maybe even sleeping in the trees for safety. But when we get to Homo habilis, this is a creature that's really making its home on the ground, right? Um, and of course, we said that it's making its home on the ground, but it's also creating tools, right? And this is the first evidence we have for tools in, the hist in primate history, okay? Now, it's possible that animals like Australopithecus could have used tools, but we don't have any evidence for it, right? Either they didn't use them, or they were using tools made of maybe wood or something, and they didn't they didn't preserve, right? So I know my, my paleoanthropology, or paleoanthropology professor used to say, until we find an Australopithecus preserved with a stone tool in their hand, it's homo, it's homo habilis that makes the tools, right? And we said that homo habilis was making this tool. It, maybe it wasn't a very impressive looking thing, but it was impressive from kind of two perspectives. The first one is that it gave Homo habilis access to a brand new food source, right? We said that there was lots of um, 
you know, lots of killed animals around uh, the African savanna by the forerunners of cheetahs and lions and things like that. But the brain was kind of inaccessible to those creatures. Most of them weren't big enough to crack open a skull. Smaller animals like jackals and other things can't get in there. But the hominid can, right? It gets its little stone tool, breaks open the skull, and has this access to this new food source, right? And again, it's very interesting to note that this food source is something that is very fatty, but also is high in omega-3s, which is good for brain development, right? So it's interesting to think about this creature that is maybe a little more intelligent than the things that came before it, using a tool and then accessing a food source that's actually good for brain development, right? Very interesting. Um, but the other thing that's good for brain development is actually the manufacture of tools, right? To, to make that tool requires a little bit of forward thought. You have to know where to find the right material. You have to figure out, is this a good stone or not? You need to know how to strike it. You need to know how to predict how the stone will break. These are, these are difficult things. These are things you have to learn. But Homo habilis does learn them and then passes them on, right? And it, we said that that was um, a significant uh, thing to know about Homo habilis as well, right? Is that here we have the beginning of passing on, sorry, passing on a patterned behavior, right? And again, that's the very kind of seed of what cultural behavior is, right? This is a very basic form of it, right? There's no values, there's no beliefs, there's no abstract concepts, there's no religion, there's no language, but there is the passing on of a skill, right? Generation after generation for almost a million years, right? So this animal is very successful developing behaviors like stone tool creation and then passing them on to other generations, right? Again, a very novel thing for um, a creature to do, right? To create a tool and then to teach subsequent generations how to make and use this tool, okay? And that brought us to, I think this is the last guy we dealt with on Friday, which was Homo erectus, right? And Homo erectus, again, big deal for a number of different reasons, right? We said that they appear around maybe a little less than a million years ago in Africa. Some of them stay in Africa, but many of them, or a number of them, migrate out, which is a big deal because no other hominid species, no other bi bipedal primate has actually left Africa before. This is the first one. You can see that the brain size is a big jump up, right? We started out around 300 or 350 cubic centimeters. With Homo habilis, we were around um, 600. Here, we're up at about 900. And that's a big deal. That's a big increase, right? That's three times, I guess, three times the original size of bipedal primate brains. <clears throat> the other reason that's a big deal, and I'll, I'm setting something up for later here, is that your brain sitting there is actually very energetically expensive, okay? It uses a lot of gas. And so your brain probably, oh gosh, how, do you, how heavy do you think your brain is? A couple pounds, maybe? Pound and a half? Let's say it's two pounds, okay? Now, that's a small proportion of your, the mass of your body, is it not? Yeah, it's not very much, but Right now, even as you sit here, hopefully listening to me and processing what's going on, but even if you're not, your brain is using about a quarter of your resting metabolism, about 25%. So your brain uses a lot of gas for its size, right? And again, that's a, that's a survival calculation, right? Creatures have to make sure they get enough calories to survive they don't, they start to slowly starve to death, right? And here we all are with this brain up here that eats a lot of fuel, right? Even if it's not really doing anything, right? Even if you're just scrolling through Instagram, 
you're still burning a lot of calories up there, right? And that's a, that's a potential problem, right? Because those calories have to be found in nature and you have to eat them, right? But we'll come back to that. Bigger brain. Homo erectus is also a little more modern human looking, if you will. Okay, so those earlier bipedal primates tended to have longer arms, shorter legs, but, and they tend to be kind of shorter overall. Homo erectus is tall, probably as tall as anyone in this room, maybe a little bit taller. They're built like us too. They've got longer legs and shorter arms. And again, that's much more efficient if you're walking or running. That's what you want, right? You want long legs. You don't need these long ape arms swinging around, right? There's some new adaptations in the foot and the leg of Homo erectus that are designed for running, but I'm going to save that until a little bit later, OK? Here you can see a Homo erectus skull, and you can see a big difference from what we saw before, right? Before we saw a very small. Uh, a very big face, sorry, and a very small brain behind it. But here we see quite an enlargement of the cranium, right? But still a pretty big, chunky face. And when I show you, um, when I show you a Homo sapiens skull, you'll see the difference is pretty marked. We have small faces, very kind of delicate bone structure, if you will. This guy's very thick. Right, heavy, heavy brow ridges. But also notice there's no forehead to speak of, right? All of our foreheads go kind of straight up and then they curve back. This guy, whoosh, right back, right? No baseball caps, Just slide right off them. So we can see here something that's starting to look a little closer to human and a little less ape-like. Um, Homo erectus is making his own tools as well, or her own tools. Um, they're called Acheulean tools or Acheulean hand axes. Most of them look like this. I'm sorry I kind of cut off part of it, but it's sort of a teardrop shaped thing. Some of them are quite large. Most of them are kind of medium to small size. And anthropologists kind of assume that this is a, a Swiss Army knife kind of tool. You can do a lot of things with it, right? You can hammer, you can scrape, you can dig, you can cut, you can do all kinds of things with this one particular tool, okay? Um, but they are, they are difficult and challenging to make, and much more challenging than the simple tool that Homo erectus, uh, Homo habilis was using, okay? We said that this is the first hominid to leave Africa, right? So. You can see here that um, Homo erectus, maybe a couple hundred thousand, no, that's sorry, that's for humans. Uh, Homo erectus is going to leave Africa. It's going to spread out through Indian subcontinent, Southeast Asia, some of the islands of Indonesia, and even all the way up into Korea. So that's kind of a big deal, right? This animal leaves its homeland, and as it does, try to imagine all of the different environments and foods and weather conditions and dangers that it would encounter in leaving Africa, right? Being kind of in where Saudi Arabia is now, being in the Indian subcontinent and throughout India, into China and Southeast Asia, up into Korea. There's all kinds of different environments, different animals, different plants, right? And Homo erectus was able to adapt to all those things, right? It was able to figure out those new environments, right? That's a big, that's a big deal for this creature. We also said that Homo erectus is a big deal because it's the first hominid that's able to control and probably, and maybe manufacture or create fire, right? And again, huge deal, right? Um, in the past, or at least prior to this point, kind of your success as an animal had to do with your physical body, right? Did you have big teeth or claws or wings or an armored shell? How did you protect yourself? Well, it was really all about your body, right? What kind of tools did you have on your body 
to protect yourself from the environment and from other animals. But here, Homo erectus is able to use a force of nature, right? They can build a big bonfire and keep other animals away, right? They can burn down sections of forest in order to encourage things to grow, right? They can cook their own food, which again is a first, right? No other animal before, well, and with the exception of us, and no other animal before has cooked their food before. Right? And the food cooking thing is important. Well, they're all important, right? The, the ability to defend yourself with fire, huge benefit. But cooking is a big deal as well, OK? And here's why. So if these animals are eating, let's say, meat from whatever source, it's safer. Right? If you cook your food, you can kill harmful parasites, right? You can, if the meat has started to spoil a little bit, cooking it can help kill off some of those things. So it becomes safer for you, right? You're more likely to survive because you're less likely to eat bad meat. Right? Easier to chew, right? It's things that are raw are really tough, right? You need big, strong, jaws to chew that stuff. Cooked meat, much softer, right? much more tender. And as a result, that's one of the things that's happening or that has happened from the time of Homo erectus to us. Our jaw is actually quite a bit smaller. right? Our teeth are smaller. Our jaw muscles are not quite so powerful. And they don't need to be because we've been cooking our own food for hundreds of thousands of years. We're eating much softer food than, let's say, Paranthropus boisei was, right? Paranthropus had to chew whatever he found. It didn't matter how hard it was. We can cook things. We can soften things, right? And we often, we often do, right? We often soak things or boil them or marinate them and then cook them in order to soften them up, right? To start the digestion process. Because they're easier to digest, these cooked foods, you guys look so tired. Are you guys OK? You're so tired. Was it a long weekend? Long weekend, a lot of work? No? Yes? Maybe? It's OK. Second half of the class will be a little bit easier, promise. Um, so. One of the things, though, it makes it easier to digest, OK? So why is that good, OK? If you look at, if you look at the human digestive tract, you will see that it's quite short, OK? Um, if you look at animals like cows, for instance, that eat lots of grass and greens, you'll see they have a long gastrointestinal tract you know, things kind of get digested and then pumped back in and back and forth. And it's a long, it's a long process. Humans have a very short digestive tract. And so we have that because we're very used to or we're becoming adapted to eating foods with very high nutrient values and things that are very, um, nutrients that are very bioavailable. So we don't have to digest things for a week. We kind of eat them, we get the energy, the stuff moves out of us and we eat again. Right? And part of the benefit to that has to do with what I was telling you about your brains. Right? Because again, in evolutionary terms, this brain is a problem. Right? It's nice that we have a nice big brain. Right? You think that would be very useful for us. But it costs money. Right? It costs energy. And if you can't find enough food, this brain will kind of starve you to death, right? Because it's using too much fuel. But when Homo erectus starts cooking food, that means that food is easier to digest, right? And again, you may know this already and you may not, but in, even in digesting food, the digestion of food actually uses a fair amount of energy, right? The longer you spend digesting, the more energy you're using just to digest the food. And so cooked food digests much easier. You use less energy. 
right? And so part of the idea here is that as Homo erectus started cooking their food, that actually gave them more energy because they didn't have to spend it digesting hard, tough things. And so that extra energy can be used to feed this thing, okay? And so again, Homo erectus didn't know any of that, but as it turned out, that might be that might be kind of part of the solution here. Again, we do see brains growing all the way through this process, right? Part of it might have to do with finding those omega-3s in the brains of um, prey animals. Some of it may have to do with what these animals are doing. They're making tools and that's building new connections and new structures in their brain. Part of it might have to do with the fact that they're now cooking their food and that gives them more excess energy to actually fuel this thing. Right? Yeah, interesting, yes? Maybe, maybe. Yeah, so cooking food, particularly cooking meat, releases an energetic constraint, okay? It gives you more free energy. You don't have to use it digesting food. You can use it for other things like running this supercomputer in your head. Well, maybe it's not a supercomputer yet, but we'll get there. <laughs> All right. <laughs> um, I couldn't resist using this. This one's probably a little more art than science, but he just looks so badass. You know, he just looks like this. This look like this brute, uh, brute of a human. Um, this is Homo heidelbergensis, and. I'll tell you now that we're, we're getting really close to Homo sapiens. We're getting close to the appearance of our own species. And as we kind of get there, things become kind of muddy, okay? So there's a few different species that are kind of around at this time. Some people think they're Heidelbergensis. Some think they're something else. Um, it, it's kind of a fuzzy, it's, it's kind of fuzzy right now. So I'm just gonna give you the easy version of what's happening knowing that there's, it's probably more complicated than this. But this is Homo heidelbergensis. Um, he, hello, and she are around from about 700,000 years ago to about 200,000 years ago, okay? Look at that brain size, right? We have now cracked, we've now cracked 1,000 cubic centimeters, right? Getting closer to our own. Here we have a creature that is similar to us in size, okay, so in height, a similar size, but if you look at this guy, even though there's, you know, there's some artistic license here, if you look at this guy, he's a pretty beefy human, is he not? Yeah, right, and you would notice that about him too, right? Bigger bones, bigger muscles, big head, right? These are kind of big brutish looking human-y type creatures, okay? So again, even though we're getting very close to the emergence of Homo sapiens, these are very different looking humans, right? Um, a couple of reasons why they're notable. Um, well, here's a, a Heidelbergensis skull, right? You can see a nice big brain behind this face. Look at those brow ridges though, right? Massive, massive brow ridges. Um, and yeah, just a really like thick, round, heavy skull, right? It looks like a soccer ball with teeth almost. Um, very, very big, tough looking human, right? There's another one, but still quite a large face, right? And again, I'll show you, when I show you the human one, you'll see what I mean because we have reasonably small faces, big face on these guys. Um, Homo heidelbergensis is important because of a few things. Number one, they are probably the first early human to live in colder temperatures, right? So Homo erectus left Africa, but didn't really go north, right? They kind of followed that southern coast into India, and they mostly stayed in reasonably warm temperatures. Homo heidelbergensis goes off and finds colder temperatures to live in, right? And so you can see here the, the first specimen of this species was found in Germany, in Heidelberg, Germany. Um, 
And so Germany would have been, at that time, would have been colder, right? It would have had an actual winter. And so these guys were bigger and tougher, but probably would have had to fashion some sort of clothing, right? They would have had to come up with some sort of clothing technology, even if it was very simple, right? Even if it was just wearing furs over top of them, they still would have had to figure out some kind of clothing. Um, yeah, they have these big, heavy set bodies. And part of that might have to do with, whoops, uh, this Bergman's rule, okay? Bergman's rule is the idea that in colder temperatures, animals tend to be bigger because they hold heat better if they're bigger. If they're smaller, they tend to release heat. And so if you see here, if you see, these are both on the top, these are both red foxes, very, a very common species here in North America. But the red fox on the right lives in a desert. And so you can see he's very slim, right? He's very light looking. Here, the red fox from like Canada or somewhere, colder, beefier, right? Thicker. Same thing with the wolf here. There's a desert wolf from the southern United States. There's a big northern wolf, right? Deer are like this too. If you go down to Florida, deer are kind of very Bambi-like, right? They're very slight and very slim. Deer up here are big, thick, big, thick honking animals, right? And it has to do with this Bergman's rule. So evolution here is acting on Heidelbergensis. The bigger, thicker guys are more successful in colder temperatures. Um, yeah, and so again, the, the picture's a little fuzzy here, but Heidelbergensis is going to be important for us because they're going to split off into kind of the two last human species to appear, ourselves and our friends Neanderthals, who are the cavemen of story, but we'll get to them in a second. Um, Heidelbergensis is the first hominid that we have evidence of them actually hunting with spears, okay? So again, it might be tempting to think that our primate ancestors were hunting much, much earlier, but this is kind of the first appearance of hunting tools, right? And so something like this is associated with Heidelbergensis. These are spear points here. You can see that they've used chipped stone They've chipped it into a point. They've taken a long wooden shaft and they've tied it with bits of animal skin, animal leather, right? Again, it took us a long time to get to that, right? There's no real hunting technology before this. So in this, you know, we started about five million years ago. Now we're about half a million years ago. It took us four and a half million years just to get technology like that. That's a long, that's a long uh, development history, right? Yeah, and so this creature here, Heidelbergensis, is eventually going to split off and evolve into two groups. One are Neanderthals, who are gonna appear in Northern Europe, just where Heidelbergensis is, and the others are us, Homo sapiens, who are first going to appear um, in Africa, just like all of the other um, bipedal primates did. Actually, wait. Again, notice that at a certain point in time here, when we're starting to appear, there are multiple hominids running around, right? Again, now there's only us, but this is a weird situation, right? Only us left? That's weird. This is much more common, right? Can you imagine we were run our ancestors were running around bumping into Homo heidelbergensis, bumping into Neanderthals, bumping into Homo erectus? Weird, right? A bunch of these creatures that are kind of similar to us, but also kind of different. Right? And speaking of different, that brings us to these guys. And I probably shouldn't say different because they're actually quite similar to us. And in fact, these things, even though they're extinct now, are the most similar thing that there has ever been to us, 
right? We share something like 99.4% of our DNA with, actually, I think it's even higher than that. Our, our DNA is almost identical to Homo neanderthalensis, right? They probably first appear about the same time that we do, maybe three, three or 400,000 years ago. And as you can see, they're around up until about 40,000 years ago. So again, in the context of this long story, like they were just here, right? They just, they just walked out the door and we just missed them, right? Um, they are very similar to us in a lot of ways, but also somewhat different, right? You can see their brain size is about the same size as ours and maybe a little bit bigger because Neanderthals tend to be bulky. They tend to be big and thick, big heads. Um, and so their brains are bigger as, um, as well. Um, so I, I'm pointing this out here again because this is the same thing that we saw earlier with Australopithecus and Paranthropus. We had a light weight, a gracile version, and a thicker, robust version. And here we have the same thing. We have Neanderthals, who are the thick, robust version. And then there's us, right? We are the lightweight, gracile version. And again, if you saw, if you saw a Neanderthal in the street, just walking down Terminal Avenue here, again, they are very similar to us. Genetically speaking, 99 point something percent. Very, very close. But you would know the difference. Right? So here's a Neanderthal skull, which is looking a little more, a little more human. Um, but their skulls are also different from ours in some pretty notable ways. So have a look at the shape of this guy's head here. So it kind of looks a little strange. He's lost a lot of his teeth in the back and here. But their heads are kind of almost like football shaped, right? We have this kind of round bubble head, right? These guys have kind of football shaped heads. And as you can see, that's a pretty, that's a pretty significant difference, right? The Neanderthal on the right and one of us, a Homo sapien on the left, right? So again, very similar creatures, but wow, big difference, right? And as a result, they're going to have a very different facial structure and a very different appearance, bless you. So, yeah, if you, if you dressed a Neanderthal in a nice looking suit, right, and sent him into a business meeting, people would notice, right? He's, you look at him and you're like, huh, something's really different about this guy, right? He looks really, really different, right? And, and he is different. He's different. What do you think he's thinking there? You guys are really tiny. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, these Homo sapiens are so wimpy. Look how scrawny they are. Do they even lift? Like, he doesn't need to lift. Um, yeah, you would, you would know, right? They're they're still a very different kind of creature. We know that they were pretty heavy meat eaters. They probably ate lots of different foods, but we have lots of tools from them. Sorry, that's a little bit cut off. We have lots of different tools for, for associated with Neanderthals, and so this kind of speaks to their intelligence, right? We see that Homo habilis just has a round stone tool, right, with a sharp edge, that's it. Homo erectus had this kind of very elegant tear-shaped hand axe that probably had a couple of functions. By the time we get to Neanderthals, they've got a whole suite of tools, right? They've got spear points. They've got spear points of different shapes and sizes. Here are, here are a bunch of different um, scrapers. And so if you're going to prepare a hide, so if you kill a deer, let's say, and you want to wear its skin to keep you warm, you need to scrape, you need to take the skin off the deer, so you skin the deer, and then on the inside you need to scrape all the fat off. 
because under the skin there's all kinds of like fat and connective tissue that used to bind it to the deer's body but you need to get rid of that if you're going to wear it and so you use you use something like this a little scraper you hold it in your hand like this it's smaller than this actually you hold it in your fingers and then you scrape all of that crud off right it's a little bit sharp on the edge but not too sharp if it's too sharp you'll just tear right through the hide and that's no good right and so Neanderthals have a whole complicated toolkit, right, to do what they want to do, to hunt the animals they want to hunt, to drill holes, to scrape things clean, to process animals. So if they kill, if they kill a deer, to sort of cut it up, right, so they can eat it. They've got a whole suite of complicated tools, way more complicated than anything that came before. So we might look at a guy like this. And I don't know, we might be tempted to think that he's not very smart. And he's certainly not as smart as you and I, for reasons we'll get to in a minute. But this is the smartest creature that ever lived to this point. This is an intelligent, this is an intelligent creature, right? Lots of different tools, very adaptable, good hunter, tough, tough animals. Right? Or humans, I should say. He's not, we're kind of beyond animals at this point. Um, I wonder what that was. No idea. There's also something else very interesting and very human-like about Neanderthals, and it showed up here. It showed up at a place called Shanidar Cave in Iraqi Kurdistan. And what paleoanthropologists found here was a series of Neanderthal remains. Okay, so they found a, a number of skeletons inside the cave. And this is kind of a, this is a reenactment of what they found, right? Obviously, they just would have found bones. But they found something that looked like this. And so the way that these, the way that these bodies were positioned led these anthropologists to believe that they were actually buried there on purpose. So these aren't Neanderthals that went exploring and then fell in the cave and died. These were people that died and were intentionally buried there, right? And that's kind of a big deal, right? Because there's not really, there's almost no animals that really show any attachment to their dead, right? But here we see Neanderthals are intentionally burying their dead, right? Intentionally taking their people to a certain place and kind of laying them to rest, right? And so some paleoanthropologists have said, well, is this, is this the beginning of religion, right? Are these Neanderthals thinking about, oh, this person was, was here and now they're gone, right? Their, their body is here, but they, they are gone. What has happened? Where do they go, right? And what do we do now with this dead person, right? And so we, of course, don't know what Neanderthals were thinking about it, but they were certainly treating these bodies, treating these people in a very human way, right? All human cultures have some kind of ritual, some kind of behavior to dispose of the dead, right? What do you do when people die? Do you burn them? Do you bury them? Do you leave them out to be exposed, like what, what do you do, right? And Neanderthals seem to be burying people or were burying people in this cave, right? Which again, is a very, it's a very human thing to do, right? Don't know what they were thinking, but they were thinking something, right? They were thinking something about the meaning of death and how to sort of say goodbye to people that are part of our group. The other thing that's very interesting is this guy here. And uh, they simply named him Shanidar One. He's the, the first skeleton I guess they found. And I don't have a better picture of him, unfortunately. But when they looked at the skeleton of this man here, Shanidar One, I think he was probably about 40 or 45 years old, which was at the time was 
quite old. Thankfully, that's not anymore. Whew. Um, and what they found was a couple of interesting things. He seemed to have sustained some injuries when he was alive. Okay. And so I think he had a, I think his skull was broken in one place and he might have had a break in his leg or something at one point too. Uh, and he also had an arm that probably was paralyzed somehow. And so when you looked, you saw, you know, a normal set of arm bones on one side. And then on the other side, they were all kind of shrunken, right? And so sometimes that happens when a limb is paralyzed, it kind of starts to shrink and atrophy, right? Because the muscles don't work anymore. And so Shanadar one had one of these, a functioning arm and seemingly a paralyzed arm. But the notable point here is that he was pretty seriously injured at some point in his life, but those injuries had healed, right? And so he had been taken care of, right? He survived because his people looked after him, right? And Again, that's a very human thing to do as well, right? To tend to the sick, right? To tend to the injured and to take care of, take care of our family, right? Take care of our people, make sure that they survive. And that's what happened here to Shanadar One, right? His, his people were there, he was hurt, maybe he was hunting, who knows? He was pretty seriously hurt, but he recovered and he lived to be quite old for that for that time so yeah his his people looked after him right and that's a very human it's a very human thing to do the other thing that's very interesting or very notable about um, Neanderthals is the location of their hyoid bone okay and if you've never heard about a hyoid bone it's because it's kind of small it's actually in your throat down here. It's kind of around your voice box. It's kind of wedged in there. And because of the location of it, it does a particular thing in humans, okay? And so if you look at something like a chimpanzee, they have a hyoid bone here that is quite high up, okay? And what it means is that chimpanzees can't have a situation where their esophagus, right, the passage to your stomach, and your trachea, the passage to your lungs, the, the chimp can't have a situation where both are open at the same time, okay? It's kind of either one or the other. But humans, as we all well know, we do have a situation where we can have both of those tubes open at the same time, right? Because who here has taken a drink of something and it went down the wrong way, and then you were coughing and spitting and you were all red in the face and you looked ridiculous and embarrassed and yeah right that's a that's a function of our anatomy and it's a function of the location of our hyoid bone now you might think that that's actually kind of a dangerous thing for an organism to have right because you can you can choke right if you have some food go down the wrong way you have to you have to heimlich people it's dangerous, right? You can actually choke to death. And so why do we have it, right? Why do we have an anatomy that creates a very dangerous situation in our throat? Well, the reason is, is that having a low hyoid allows you to make a lot of the sounds that humans make, okay? A lot of the language sounds that humans make. And so if you look at a gorilla, for instance, there's gorillas who have been taught human language, right? But when they speak to you, they use sign language. I don't know how to sign, obviously. Um, they use sign language, right? And it's not because they're not really smart enough to speak. It's because they don't really have, they don't really have the anatomy to speak, right? And so us and Neanderthals are really the only creatures, the only primates to have a hyoid bone that is so low. And so we think that that means that Neanderthals could probably make the same sounds that we could, okay? Not to say that they had language that was like us, not to say that their language was complex like ours is, but 
they could make a lot of probably this, of similar sounds that we could. And so Neanderthal language might have sounded quite similar to maybe some human languages because they probably were able to make a lot of the same sounds. Right? Homo erectus? No. Right? Even if you could teach a Homo erectus how to speak our language, it wouldn't be able to make all the sounds. It wouldn't be able to do what we can do. Right? Yeah, and so that kind of brings us all the way to about 300,000 years ago and to us, right? The stars of the show, if we want to be egotistical. The stars of the show, right? Um, probably appearing <clears throat> around 300 or 350,000 years ago um, are Homo sapiens, right? Again, we evolve in Africa and we're going to spread out. But first, I think it's time for a break. I feel like people are a little little fidgety and probably need to refocus so let's take a little break we'll come back and i'll tell you about yourselves
No, I had that before. <laughs> that would be fast. <laughs> No, I thought it was a little, just a little too, just a little too relaxed, but people are taking, <laughs> people are taking a while to quiet down. I wish I had one so I could just like throw it in the garbage when I come in. <laughs> it's a, it's an AP bio thing, Netflix series. Okay. Are we ready? Can I, can I get back to work now? Yeah. Yes? OK. I don't mind taking a longer break. No, I do mind. Let's go. OK. So finally, after long last, we come to us, right? Homo sapiens. Millions and millions of years of evolution produces this creature here, right? Um, now, as part of our kind of more recent developments, we used to think that our species was only about 200,000 years old, but some very recent excavations in Morocco, of all places, have shown that Homo sapien remains are there um, about 300,000 years ago. So again, that's kind of a weird thing because a lot of excavations were taking place in East Africa, which is kind of where you can access fossils of this age. And so we thought we were actually quite young as a species. But here in Morocco, we have archaeological evidence of Homo sapiens showing up at least 300,000 years ago. And um, I said in late September, but this is probably late September of like 2019, 2018 probably. Um, but DNA sequencing has shown that maybe our species is up to 350,000 years old. So our species is a little older than we originally thought it would be. Um, so here we are, the skull of a, of a Homo sapien, right? You can see that it's quite similar to the ones we've seen before, but actually quite a bit different as well, right? Homo sapiens, us humans, we have very small faces and quite a large, quite a large brain case, right? There's a really big brain behind this small face, right? You can see it's, we've, got, uh, we've actually got a forehead, right? Unlike Homo erectus or Neanderthalensis, who their head kind of goes straight back. We have a forehead here. Part of, that is, part of that is to do with brain structures, but we'll get to that later. We have a very small jaw, right? Look how small. Remember those earlier ones where it looks like they had this gigantic jaw? We have a really tiny jaw, right? Hundreds of thousands of years of cooking our food means that we don't need giant jaw muscles, right? We don't need big jaws. We don't need giant teeth. We've got kind of small teeth, right? And a small jaw. We've all got a chin, right? If you reach under your mask, you can kind of feel it sticking out, right? That chin exists because your teeth have gotten smaller, right? Remember. Those earlier hominids, they, they just kind of curved down. They had no chin. Well, your teeth are kind of shrinking back into your head, you know, over thousands of years. But they're kind of shrinking back into your head. And so it's actually leaving this jaw sticking out. And so we have a chin when none of the others do because our dentition, our teeth are actually getting smaller, right? And we're actually losing teeth as well. Um, do you guys know what wisdom teeth are? Yeah. yeah? Who has their wisdom teeth? Are they coming in or are they in? The ones, the ones that are way at the back? Who, who has all four? Or had all four? Four? Does anyone have three? They took all of them out, but you have? You still have four? Anyone have three? Two? Six. You can have six. 
Hey, we discovered a new human species. <laughs> Congratulations. You're the first of your kind. Um, <laughs> it's probably the case that we are actually losing those teeth. Because again, we don't really need to chew hard, heavy stuff the way we used to. Our jaws are kind of getting smaller. And so as a result, people like Sabrina and others, we're probably going to have them pulled out because there's no room, right? Yeah, I have two knees right there. Because my teeth are huge and my jaws are small. Yeah, teeth are huge, jaws are small, right? And that's kind of what's happening with our species. Our jaws are getting quite small. Our teeth are kind of shrinking, maybe not at the same rate. And so there's just not enough. Yeah, it's pushing it to the front. There's not enough room in your small mouth for all of your teeth. And so we're kind of losing them, right? And probably, you know, in another, I don't know, 5,000 years or so, maybe nobody will have wisdom teeth, right? I, for me, I only have two, or had two. I had them taken out. But I only had the top ones. The bottom Does ones. Bottom wisdom teeth? No. Like never grew? Never, never grew. Never there? No, you, even if you look at the x-ray, they're not, they're, they never, they never developed. Yeah. They're all what? I don't have any. You don't have any of them. Does that mean she's more involved than I am? Yes. No. <laughs> and why are you a newer version? She's a newer version? Uh, maybe. She's maybe. older than me. <laughs> so, my point here, my point here is that you know, evolutionary forces are acting on are acting on Homo sapiens just like they're acting on other creatures, right? And again, in evolution, it's kind of use it or lose it, right? Neil Shubin said that our ancestors millions of years ago probably had a really good sense of smell, right? But as our eyes became our dominant sense, which they are today, a bunch of the genes that controlled our sense of smell got kind of shut off because we didn't really need them anymore. And now, as animals go, we have a horrible sense of smell, right? You can't really smell as compared to a dog. You can't really smell anything, right? Blind person has more of a sense They do say that, right? They do say that when you lose one of your senses, your others become heightened. I don't know if that's the case or if you just rely on them more. True. I don't know if they get better. Maybe. But. Maybe. Um, but yeah, evolution is. Okay, gentlemen, don't make me talk over you, even if you are a new human species. <clears throat> we'll call, we'll call uh, the Smithsonian later. So evolutionary forces are kind of happening and working on Homo sapiens as well, right? So here, let me just, I'll walk you through the skulls that we have seen so far. Okay, so this was our Australopithecus afarensis. This was Lucy. And so have a look. Big difference, right? Yeah. Yeah. Lucy, Lucy's got a big face, right? Big brow ridges, tight pinch behind here, and then a tiny brain, right? Big jaw muscles, but here, Nope, sorry. But here, totally changed, right? Really big brain, smaller face, small jaw, right? So if we kind of walk through, we'll see that process kind of occurring, right? As the brain grows and the face generally gets smaller. Although even Neanderthals have a pretty big face. Um, yeah, we have quite a, quite a small one. So. You can see here, pretty. Th there's been a pretty drastic change, right, over these millions of years. So, Homo sapiens, right, a very lightly built um, hominid, right, as opposed to Heidelbergensis, who's probably a direct ancestor of ours. Our cousin species, Homo neanderthalensis. Those guys are really thick, football player, you know, times ten brutish kind of kind of characters but we're much light we're, we're kind of more lightly built right more slim 
um, evolved in warm temperatures. Um, if you look at our tools, you'll see that our tools are much more refined than Neanderthals are, especially after 70,000 years ago, but I'll get to that in a, a minute or two. Eventually, we're going to invent all kinds of very complicated tools. And so Neanderthals are using simple spears and a bunch of stone tools to do various, uh, various types of jobs, which again is very advanced, but we're going to take that even further, right? And we're going to invent composite tools, so tools that are made of multiple materials. We're going to invent tools that use mechanics like bow and arrows and atlatls. Um, but we're not really going to do that until about 70,000 years ago. Okay. So from the beginning of our species, 350,000 years ago, all the way up to about 70,000 years ago, you probably would find Homo sapiens are roughly as intelligent as Neanderthals, give or take. Okay? And what, as, a, as a comparison, what you would probably find is that Neanderthals are not nearly as smart as any of you in the room here. Okay? Um, again, at the time, they're the smartest creatures that have ever, that have ever existed. Right? But if you had a conversation with a Neanderthal, you'd kind of think they were dummies. <laughs> um, and the reason is, is because there's kind of one more step of evolution that has to take place for us to become the humans that we all kind of are used to and, and know ourselves to be. And it happens about 70,000 years ago, okay? Now, what's going to happen here has to do with uh, the appearance of language in our species. But to talk about this, I wanted to show you uh, a very short video, which is will kind of give us an interesting piece to brain development and how we're sort of similar to primates, but also different, okay? And so the question is this, and I'm just going to take a second here to, um, I just want to grab the, uh, bu 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 bu. do I have it here? I just got to grab the link for this video here. Um, number nine. The question is this. The question is, I'm terrible at multitasking, so I can't do two things at the same time. There we go. So if you're watching at home, we're going to watch this video in just a second. So I'll just put it into the live chat right there. Um, this is the question. If human language is so good, and it is, right? It's a very helpful innovation for us. We rely on it very heavily, right? We've been using language for the past two hours in here and all through our day. If it's so good, why are we the only ones that have it? Why are we the only animals that have developed this particular style of communication? Right? How did we do that? Why are we different from the others? And so we're going to watch this video. And while we watch it, I want you to pay attention to a few different questions, OK? And so yeah, I'll put these up on the screen for now, and then we'll, we'll come back to them in a second. First of all, the video will talk a little bit about what skills might have been necessary when our ancestors moved from living in the trees to living on the ground, OK? It was kind of a change in their habitat. What kind of new skills might they have needed, OK? Um, we're going to visit a primate research lab in Japan. And they're going to, um, the, 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 lead of, the lead sort of researcher there has discovered a kind of a very interesting difference between chimpanzee brains and our brains. And actually, I think you'll be very impressed and probably surprised at what you see. Um, again, how did the natural environment shape our need for language? What's the cognitive trade-off hypothesis? That's what we'll kind of hear about in this video. What kind of makes us us? Okay. Um, do the results of the memory test surprise you, yes or no? 
And what sort of lesson might we learn about evolution in general from this short video? Okay. So uh, uh, we're going to have to probably talk about this on Friday, but we can watch the video today anyway. So online people, I'll direct you to watch this video. The link is in the live chat. Um, we'll watch the video and then we'll come back here maybe to discuss for just a minute, okay? So we'll see you moment.
So yeah, very interesting, hey? Yeah. And you thought you were all so smart. But man, that chimpanzee is quick, hey? Nine numbers. Wow. Uh, let's talk about that on Friday. I have uh, some film to show you, which is an interesting documentary on human movement. But until then, you can pack it up. Hope you have a nice week. I'll see you Friday, okay? Thank you.